Hi, my name is N.K. Jemison. I am the author of the Broken Earth Trilogy, including The Stone Sky, um, for which we are up for some awards. Hi, I'm Robin Miles, and I am the narrator of the Broken Earth books. Uh, we are thrilled to be up for the Audio Award for Best Science Fiction Novel, and also for Best Female Performer. So, mm -hmm. fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. One of the things I found most fascinating mm -hmm. was the second person position, hmm. uh, narrating from the second okay. person, because it almost never comes up. I think one time in my life I've ever come across that. I mean, it's not common, but it's it, it's difficult to use um, in a way that doesn't sound pretentious. Yeah. And I think, you know, because of that, people sort of shy away from it and assume mm -hmm. that second person doesn't work or second person itself is the problem. But really, it's just a question of like how you use it and yeah. how you convey it and whether the character is, yeah. uh, whether the, the narrative is something that it actually sort of fits. That's what um, I learned. Oh, oh, okay. We so got to that and, and I went, oh my God, the second oh. person thing. It really works. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, it's. But not... I hadn't seen it work before. Oh. Okay, see, the thing that, that caught it for me, or the thing that made it work for me, was um, Italo Calvino's If on a Winter's Night a Traveler. Um, mm. And also, I'm a giant role-playing video game nerd. So ah, I'm used to, okay. you know, kind of being put into the you position. You do blah, blah, blah. Right, um, okay. And so it doesn't feel cool. quite as foreign to me, yeah. but it's really just, it's like any other literary form. It's just a matter of how you use it. Mm -hmm. and, and familiarity with it. I okay. remember... We went into the studio on the first day, mm -hmm. I had the microphone in front, and there are the two positions, you know, third person, it was actually all, all three mm -hmm. get used, first person, mm -hmm. second person, third person. By the third book, yeah. And I wanted it, I thought, how do we orally mm -hmm. create a feeling? Mm -hmm. And so it became leaning, literally leaning into the microphone mm -hmm. as if I were speaking into somebody's huh. either from within their own head uh -huh. or like... Uh, almost like on a phone you know, or, or or in a very intimate mm -hmm. very close to them mm -hmm. position mm -hmm. um and i found i loved it yeah because i could get even further into the mm. intimacy hmm. level i had not ever attempted to use second person before i started writing the fifth season basically i i experiment whenever i'm writing a new book with different voices, different tenses, different viewpoint characters, mm -hmm. um, until I find something that sort of clicks. And I tried this, and it was just sort of like a random cockamamie, why not? Mm -hmm. um, and it suddenly clicked. And there's a, a, there's a thing that I discovered while I was working on it, which is that second person is sort of this weird combination of intimate and distant. And, and I felt that when I was listening mm -hmm. to your narration, I didn't feel it while I was writing it. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I think I do. So, because the human voice is gonna add some, mm, an unseen thing. Yeah, when you're saying that you lean closer to the, to the microphone, I could, I didn't know that's what you were doing, um, but there was, a, there was a feeling of closeness that wasn't there when I hear it in my head, in your if head. that makes sense. I always feel that my job is to put my body and my mm. voice in service to mm. the author and the text. Mm. Okay. And after a certain amount of time reading, mm -hmm. the length of your thought mm. must become the length of my thought. My, I ha my body has to say that's mm -hmm. the length of my thought now. It always takes me a few pages, mm. um, maybe a couple of chapters, depending on how different in rhythm and speed um, the book and the author is from me but mm. my job is to just give my body over mm. Um, mm. and it's mm. funny you would think mm. spending six hours a day mm. in front of a microphone mm. the first thing I'd want to do when I take a break is go in a corner and be quiet <laughs> right I would think but I'm a giant introvert so <laughs> I always want to do that okay all I want to do when I take a break from something that I've completely given myself over to mm -hmm. is go in a corner and talk because I want to hear my thoughts and I want to talk in my rhythm oh. and in the length of thoughts. I just need to reclaim myself for a minute. Mm -hmm. and I like, mm -hmm. feel that okay. Right. Yeah. And right. then I can right. go back to it and completely give myself to it again. That's kind of similar to how I feel when I write. When I'm writing, I get, I am, I am the character <clears throat> for the period that I am doing their narration. I'm inside their head. Um, I'm thinking as they're thinking or speaking as they're speaking. Um, but I don't ever feel any particular need to kind of 
separate out, I guess, because I am an yeah. introvert and internal processor. So the instant that I stop writing, the the other voice stops, and then I become myself. I don't have to. I don't have to exert it. If well, that makes sense. Would but. you describe that as being like a vessel? It is the nature of any form of art, I think, that you yeah. are you are yes the vessel through which these characters, this story, whatever must come. You're you're filtering it through your own perception. You're obviously guiding and directing it. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're really flowing with any kind of art, you know, my father is a visual artist. It's, mm -hmm. He has the same feeling. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I used to call it the zone. You get into this frame where you can feel yeah. that the art is dictating itself. Mm -hmm. That the, the, the voice is conveying what needs to be conveyed. And the voice is coming from your head or from your throat or from his, his paint in yeah. my father's case. But, wow. um, you say mm -hmm. in the zone, I call it in the pocket, mm -hmm. which is like a jazz mm -hmm. term, but mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But it's the same feeling. Same at the feeling. End of the day. It's this when you know you've got it. When when you're doing whatever you're doing, you're writing, you're you're painting, you're something, and you know for that moment that you are you are you're on point. You've got it. You're like the greatest person in the world. And then afterward, you're like, oh wait, no, I'm not really that great. But then you know, <laughs> that's called editing. When I when I listen to um, the audiobooks of these, I am able to connect with them as a reader. It doesn't make any sense. But, um, mm -hmm. but when I read my books, I'm still editing. I'm still, you know, the writer. I can't shut off my inner editor. Yeah. But when I'm listening to the audiobooks, I'm actually um, able to pull back enough. Mm -hmm. They are detached from me enough that I can listen to it and be like, oh, hey, this is actually good. You know, like, like I have yeah. that moment of, whoa, wait, I wrote that? I wrote that. Um, <laughs> I but, have that um, experience. Sometimes oh. I'll listen to a book I did, mm -hmm. and I get so deeply lost in the character that mm -hmm. I forget that that's me. When I turn the book off, mm -hmm. I, you know, or I get to a point where I'm at a saturation point, right. I might, and I went, wow, that was mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And one time I was like, oh my goodness, I've mm -hmm. gotten good. <laughs> oh, nice. But, wow. And it's very, it's, it's, I mean, and I have that response mm -hmm. of getting mm -hmm. small because it's humbling mm -hmm. to me mm -hmm. to, you know... Uh, to feel that you realize it's you such a gift. It's like I was given a gift, and that's humbling. Yeah, that's um, when you realize it's a channel that you're a vessel. That's when you realize, yeah, that you know, for a minute you weren't really there. Someone else was. I remember when when I when you first started doing the narration for the fifth season, um, I needed to tell you some of the spoilers um, that were that were going to come up so that you could. Um, kind of know this about the characters in advance. Right. The first thing I knew I needed to do was make sure that the who am I of that character, the personality, the tendencies mm -hmm. stay consistent. Because mm -hmm. people do mm -hmm. change a little as they grow and as they go through trauma. Right. What I found was I had to have a core. Mm -hmm. And it couldn't go too far from that core. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that person had to stay the same. Mm -hmm. And she's more naive. She's not, she doesn't have as great a sense of agency, especially in the beginning. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. a lot of wonder. Mm -hmm. um, and I do believe there are two different meanings, very separate from naivete and innocence. Mm -hmm. I agree. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So you can have a character who's naive and innocent, mm -hmm. and as she gets older, she can stay a little naive. She hasn't learned enough yet, but mm -hmm. she's not innocent anymore. Or yeah. vice versa. Yeah. But we had to decide that that person has to be a whole person mm -hmm. in book one, and to a certain degree in book two, because it's really one. not till book That's three the that the real, um, yeah. everything blows up out of that. Yeah. Um, and all of a sudden, this mm -hmm. line mm -hmm. in forward and backward in time kind of shoots out like that. Mm -hmm. um, I that like, was the greatest challenge. I've had a couple of instances now where mm -hmm. I've started a book, um, first character, first mm -hmm. appearance, and mm -hmm. I can't. Mm -hmm. The muse isn't talking to me. Mm -hmm. It takes a while to come. And I put book. in a placeholder and I keep going. I mm -hmm. had that happen. I got to second chapter. Mm -hmm. I thought, I'm just going to mm -hmm. just go open. Just mm -hmm. when she starts to speak, just whatever comes out. Mm -hmm. And this character came out and she was talking. Oh. I mean, she had this deep voice. And then you had to go back and redo the and first chapter. And I went back and re but I and thought that you got got the voice. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and I had yeah. with your work in particular, oh. Tonky. 
Tonk. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love the way that you did Tonky's voice. I like, oh, but I loved her. Perfectly for her, yeah. Yeah. Um, I had not intended for Tonky to have, like, quite the role that she did, but she's such an outsized character. She was just sort of like, no, no, I'm going to be here. Loved um, her. You're going to have to deal with that. So, yeah. You gave me the best challenges. I hope Because so. she, you know, she's a kid in the yeah. first book. She's got agency, yeah. that little girl. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I wanted it, to convey that Donkey's kind of a horror show no matter what. Early, she's late. Going, you know, she's going to do what she wants to do. Beat my own path, thank you very much. Exactly. Which yeah. she continues to do. And I thought, well, as she grows up and mm -hmm. she becomes this adult, mm -hmm. I need to keep the core, the seed of that mm -hmm. Tonky from book one. Mm -hmm. I can't let it stray too far from the seed. Well, I think the thing I love is um, with Tonky's voice, the fact that you gave it like a little southern element mm -hmm. my, my southern accent is is situational it appears mm -hmm. when i am in mobile it goes away the instant i get back on the plane mm -hmm. um and yeah. i don't know why it's just like literally a switch on switch off yeah. and i don't think about it it just happens but i notice myself sliding into it sometimes when i run into people who are being obnoxious about you know about dialect, about uh, ways of, of speaking, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I find myself slipping into it as a kind of like, you know, I don't know what you think about people who speak like this, but I speak like this, and, and I want to see how you're going to react to that. Mm -hmm. um, and that to me feels like, you know, that feels like the, the attitude that you were conveying with Tonki's use of that dialect. She's brilliant. Yeah, she's, she's brilliant. She's just dropped And she's going to talk exactly the way that she wants, and she's going to sound exactly how you want, and you're going to accept that one way mm -hmm. or another. Yeah. So. You know what it is? I think it was that that quality of being slightly socially awkward mm. that brilliant people often have. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Tonki is socially awkward mm. because yeah. she's brilliant. Yeah. Um, although I love although the fact that you so give much, her a lover. Yeah, it's not so much awkwardness in Tonki's case as, as I don't care in Tonki's yeah, case. Yeah. <laughs> Social But she doesn't, a yeah, she doesn't <laughs> soften her edges for everybody yeah. to make the, them yeah. comfortable in the room. Yeah. But I, yeah. I think, personally, I have always admired the hell out of people who don't give a fuck. Um, and Tonki's don't yeah. give a fuck is, like, at level 10. So I have nothing but admiration for this. Mm. Um, and it just, it, you know, when you're talking about her lover, it, it seemed... It seemed obvious to me that somewhere out there, there was another person who would immediately fall in love with that don't that, give a fuck mess. Yeah. And just be like, yeah, that's, that's, that's the woman for me. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and maybe that's, you know, I'm con trying to convey what I'm interested in. But, <laughs> um, but you know, on some level, yeah. um, you know, it seemed obvious to me that that kind of strength and that kind of um, attitude would be attractive to a person. Yeah. Why wouldn't it be? Yeah. So, yeah. And I, but um, mm -hmm. again, it's that idea of subverting mm -hmm. those old patterns mm -hmm. that had so many boundaries on them. You mm -hmm. can't do this. It's mm -hmm. just not done. Mm -hmm. They don't do that. You know, mm -hmm. I've had that since I was a kid. I was yeah. a swimmer. Mm -hmm. Everywhere I went, it was like, oh, Black people don't swim. <laughs> yeah, no, we do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's happening now. We had it like Olympics, happens. but, yeah. but, but that idea, I mm. was dissuaded from mm. doing so many things. Mm -hmm. um, still happens now. Still happens. Yeah. I, I did a little uh, video for Hidden Figures, mm. and the fact that Margot mm -hmm. Lee Shetterly does that, okay. she trumps our myths of incapability. Uh, it, they're myths. Yes. And she yes. calls it uh, for what they're, it is. They're constructed myths with a purpose. Mm -hmm. um, they're designed to try and create an incapability that was never really there. That was never really there. Yeah. yeah. yeah.